This program was made possible by by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation and by contributions to your PBS station by viewers like you. Thank you. PBS American Portrait is a platform that allows people to share their experiences, to tell their stories, using the prompts that PBS American Portrait put out. I was raised to believe. I took a risk when. What gets me out of bed in the morning? What gets me out of bed in the morning? Is that I've got a purpose. It's the fact that we're going to be doing something special. What gets me out of bed in the morning? Probably my mom and dad. Work. School. Music. Coffee. Vince Optimism. My faith. My kids. Knowing that I have to be like the best dad <laughs> that I could possibly be. The thought that maybe this will be the day I figure out how to make my dream come true. The idea that every morning there's a new problem to solve. So that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's your story. The millions of stories that make up this country. Just regular people like you, me. Everyone has different story to tell and share. People's videos and pictures. A digital tapestry. It's just a place to be heard and feel valued and listened to. Escuchar los diferentes puntos de vista de las personas de diferentes orígenes, de diferentes clases, de diferentes edades. To inspire and to encourage one another. our common humanity in the American experience. This is who we are. That's what's great about it, is that you feel connected to a giant place because we all share little tiny snippets about our lives. Most days I feel... This project can help bring us together. To listen to each other. Sharing your own ideas, your feelings. Your challenges, your, your drive. What makes us the same, what makes us different. We all have a story to tell. All around the United States to reflect our true American portrait. I was raised to believe that there is a God. And a higher power. I was raised to believe in old fashioned God. There's a much higher power in my, my life, and that power is Jesus Christ. And that everybody has a purpose on this planet for something, and not to lie to anybody or try to cheat anybody out of anything. That there's good in the world. I was raised to believe they have respect for everyone. Everyone should be treated equally, be able to be a part of the community, and feel good about themselves no matter what choices they choose to do in life to respect others, to be kind to others, and they would be kind to me, and that someday I would be a mom, and I would understand. Family and friends are always precious. And it's not where you live, it's how you live, and that you've got to have a social conscience and you've got to act on it. You treat other people the way you hope to be treated, and whatever you gain or lose in life, never lose your integrity. What you do for others will come back in one way or another, or go on to other people. So if you help somebody, and either they'll help you back, or later on they'll help somebody else out who needs it more. And so I just try and live my life by that. That it's important to be kind to other people, be respectful, treat others how you would want to be treated, 
and also the value of hard work and not giving up and also not thinking yourself as a victim think of yourself as a strong person who can do anything that you want to do you know if you work hard for anything then you can get um, anything that you want I was raised to believe that with hard work and perseverance I could do anything I wanted and that seemed fairly true up until I turned 24. I suddenly lost my eyesight due to a rare genetic condition. And it was after that and getting back on my feet that I realized that hard work and perseverance doesn't work for everyone. That's why what I do now is work hard to educate people and to fight for disability rights, to try to make things better, to try to make it so that people with disabilities with hard work and perseverance can do most everything because um, getting rid of barriers is going to do that and letting people know just how capable we are and that simply making things more accessible can really change things and change people's lives. When I step outside my door, I am prepared and ready for the day. Well, the first thing I do is make sure that I'm fully dressed. Make sure I have my coat and cane. Just make sure I have my house key because I always forget it. I usually go just to take care of my business, my appointments. I face a lot of challenges. I try and overcome. Well, I'm in a wheelchair. I roll out the door. Hope it's not raining. It's like going on with my day. When I step outside my door in 2020, I make sure I have a mask on. When I step outside my door, I look forward to a new day. Taking my dogs on a long walk. I try to look at my yard to try to keep it up, and I, I enjoy people talk a lot. <laughs> I love the freedom. I love the wind, the birds, and always watching my dog play in the yard. I always try to take in the nature and look at all the trees. Grass and trappy and sunlight. There's the light, there's the sounds, there's the smell. I can see people, my neighbors, I can see what they've been doing in their yard, what they've accomplished. I like to smell the fresh air. I like to look at my roses and look at my elephant ears. I believe that I can make the day as good as it can be. I think how beautiful it is that I woke up this morning. I thank God every day I'm alive. It's beautiful, it's miraculous, and it's amazing what can change in a single 24 hour period. Grasp it, hold on to it, and appreciate it. Life's short. When I step outside my door, I see the whole University of Missouri campus. I had taught here for many years, and I love it, go Tigers! And SIL is an important part of my life. I could not do it without them. I will not see 50 again. And SIL has been what has kept me going. They are, in some cases, my very best friends, but they're always there. And I have had some serious problems with my legs and couldn't walk and had to go to a doctor after a doctor after a doctor for a long time. But they've always been there for me. And I will be eternally grateful for that because if it were not for SIL, what they say, independent living, I wouldn't be living independently. I took a risk when we decided that we wanted to try and get pregnant again. We ended up pregnant with twins. My kidneys started shutting down. My lupus started attacking myself. Um, since it's an autoimmune disease, it kind of attacks different organs in your body and it started rejecting the pregnancy. So unfortunately, we ended up losing the twins and um, that's 
kind of a, a sad thing that people with disabilities often have to deal with is that we don't get to have easy pregnancies like other people all the time. When I moved into this trailer park and took over as manager. Driving my old car to Chicago to take care of my brother. <laughs> I don't want to tell you it broke down as soon as I got there, though. But I made it. And I left my small town that I was raised in to go live in a big city to find my future. I quit my job and I moved to Blue Springs, where the only person I knew was my big brother. I didn't know if I was going to have a job. I didn't know how, where we were going to live. <laughs> When I left my home state of Texas and came to Missouri in order to have a different life, a quieter life, a smaller life, but in many ways it has grown larger. When I gathered some of my poetry together and asked my son to desktop publish it for me, now I'm enlightened as to why many poets are paupers. The day that I decided I did not like the way I was living, uh, the way I looked, and the, the way I just genuinely uh, felt in overall in life. So I decided to start having elective surgeries to um, improve my uh, conditions that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I took a risk when I went back to school as an adult with three young kids to finish my degree. I decided to go to college since I'm a first-generational college student. I went back to college as a non-traditional student and graduated in 2014 with a Bachelor's of Psychology. I took a risk when I married my wife. When I kissed my fiancé for the first time and he kissed me back, so we are now engaged. When I married my husband, but we've been together for 50 years, so I guess it paid off. Ever since I'm in a wheelchair, it seems like I take a risk every day. But I, gotta, I do what got to be done so I can make it to another day. I took a risk when I decided to work with home health care instead of deciding to go into a nursing home. When I decided to live independently on my own. The condition I carry on is taking care of my children and Christopher is my pride and joy. Don't get me started, I'll start crying on that one. <laughs> I like to tell family stories, even if they become somewhat mythological. I like to tell what happened in my childhood, the lessons, and things like when you throw a pebble in a puddle, those ripples could go on infinitely. I'm a member of the Western Cherokee Nation, born for the Long Hair Clan, and the tradition I carry on is what my elders taught me. I think the one I'll carry on is animal rescue. I grew up with it. My grandmother helped start the animal adopt days in Missouri and her sister helped with it and I grew up doing animal rescue and so I think I'll just stick to helping animals. I try to make sure my dogs are healthy every day. They're my my love and companions. They keep me happy. They're happy, I'm happy. That we always have turkey for Thanksgiving and ham for Christmas and open one present Christmas Eve. We like to decorate the outside of the house with my daughters, definitely my oldest daughter, um, so it's something that we definitely look forward to. Every Christmas I will buy Christmas ornaments for my children and I have their names, either I do it or I have their names engraved in the year that, of the Christmas that it was and I put them on the tree. We buy a small pumpkin and we get a permanent marker. We all write down what we're grateful for for that Thanksgiving and we leave it in the center of the table. Um, we eat dinner and then we play games and before it's all over we do a cookie swap. My mother started this way back before she passed away in 2011 because she didn't like to cook all day on Christmas Day. She wanted to spend time with her kids and grandkids. So to do that, she would make something simple that she could just serve on Christmas Day. And she decided one year it was going to be tacos. And then it just seemed like every year we were having tacos on Christmas because everybody liked it. And now 
here it is 12 years later and my family still has tacos on Christmas Day. You can see all your brothers, your sisters, your moms, your dads, your aunts and uncles, and everybody you can have a good time. You sit to tell jokes, you eat great food, you fill up till you fall asleep or fall out on a patio <laughs> or something like that. But it's an excellent time. I loved, loved it very much. My Saturday night involves family. Uh, usually we are either hanging out as a family or watching a movie as a family. Bonfires in fall, um, but for us it's definitely Saturday nights are full of family time. Hanging with family and friends. Family time, Bible study, and prayer. My Saturday night is the end of Sabbath, so it often looks like Bible study, prayers, time with the family, and movies. Mainly a night of just relaxation after a day of work. You know, I get to sit down and watch TV, play video games, but I also like to work out from time to time too. Usually my Saturday night is pretty mundane, but sometimes I'll have a get together at my house with friends or I'll go out and have a nice dinner or cocktail with my friends. But usually I'm sitting home right now, I'm watching college football, watching Netflix, reading books on my Kindle, listening to music, I'm on Facebook connecting with my friends in this time of COVID. And um, I just try to keep myself busy, but I do love my Saturday night. Whatever Missouri Tiger Sports Athletic event happens to be on, on television or going on at that time, or if there's a Blues game, I'm right there as well. Go Blues. My Saturday night is pretty uneventful, but my Saturday night is mostly a cola, a comforter, and PBS Masterpiece. Honestly, I'm kind of lazy. It's like my husband's only day off work, so we just kind of lay around, go shopping, spend time with the family, play with the animals. Spending time with my grandchildren and sometimes they spend the night. I'm always out and about doing uh, stuff with my niece, you know, like, getting groceries and getting the supplies I need to make my life as easy as I can. My typical Saturday night usually isn't typical. Um, sometimes I feel great and my husband and I will go out to dinner or hang out with friends or do something fun with our son. Um, I have lupus, which is an autoimmune disease, so um, usually Saturdays aren't typical. It just depends on what my disability wants me to do that day. Well, it kind of depends. Some Saturday nights, I'm playing D&D, &D, or for those of you who don't know, Dungeons and Dragons with my friends. This uh, time of year during COVID, we're playing online. But one of the most important things to me is that my group of friends gets that I can't see. And so as long as you have people in your life that understand what your needs are, um, I think that's possible. And you can still have a wonderful time and um, play whatever game you want. My American story started in the 60s and 70s with a lot of chaos in this society. My American story began when my mother gave birth to me. When my mother had me 64 years ago. When I became a wife, a mother, a home, home owner, um, a grandma, and I would have to say grandma, that was the bonus. I graduated high school with a 3.9, three point average, and I just tried to live the life to the fullest. When we had the bicentennial in um, 1974, and the town I lived in had this great big carnival, So that kind of made me realize what everything was about. And my American story actually started before we were ever the United States, when we were just the colonies. I'm related to Jeremiah Dixon, surveyor of the Mason-Dixon line. Our family has a plantation in Virginia, Chesapeake, Virginia, that was finished in 1780 and is still 
there till this day and is now actually a bed and breakfast. After the Civil War, my grandmother Dixon, who was a teacher, started teaching little girls and the women on the plantation how to read, write, and do their numbers so that they could be educated people because my grandmother felt that the only way that they could go on from going from being slaves to being working uh, adults in the new world was by being able to read, write, and do numbers. But it really didn't start till I moved to Columbia, Missouri where I learned what an independent living center was and how I could learn to be independent. I was surprised that all during my years in Chicago, no, no one ever taught me that people with disabilities could be independent. I had to move to Columbia before I learned that um, independent living was possible for citizens with disability. And I'm very proud to be a consumer of services for independent living. And we all are given a script in life. And um, so mine has, part of my, part of my story has been written, but so much of my life has yet to be written. And um, I have no idea what's going to happen. I've been through a lot in my life and there's a lot to my story. And I'm looking forward to the next chapter. And um, yeah, there's a lot of blank pages left to be written in my story. So my American story started when I became deaf, when I was 23 years old. I was a student at the University of Georgia and I got sick with spinal meningitis. I had never met a deaf person. I had never seen sign language before. Uh, I had to learn how to live um, and not be able to hear myself or anyone around me. It changed my world overnight. And, uh, and so my American story started at that time. I had to figure out how to live and not be able to hear in a world and in a country where I could the day before. And it was very odd. Um, so I had to step out of um, going to the University of Georgia for a time and I went to Gallaudet University to learn sign language. And wow, what, a, what an experience. Then I went back to the University of Georgia and <laughs> gives me goosebumps. Uh, went, went back to the University of Georgia and finished my degree in psychology and I started working at the university and then I wanted something different. And that's where the American dream sort of started for me. I, I applied for a job uh, to be the executive director of an agency serving deaf people that was getting started. And I applied and I got the job that I wasn't qualified for 25 years ago. And it changed my life. It was nothing. It was an empty space. There was nothing in the room. And, and uh, so I was the first employee and I had to hire people and I had to develop programs and services for the deaf community in Missouri. And I was doing things I never thought in my life I would do those things. I was working on mental health and crisis intervention and domestic violence and sexual violence with deaf people and learning and, and growing and and hiring and working with people and volunteers and developing a crisis line that would serve victims of crime that were deaf. And in uh, and 25 years, I'm still in that job and still excited and, and still love what I do every day. And I have been impacted by each person that's come into the doors of the agency, whether it be through you know um, uh, serving that person, working with them, or hiring them or, you know, technical assistance with an organization serving deaf people or whatever. And each person has impacted me. And I never would have had that opportunity um, if I hadn't become deaf. So my American story started with something that I lost. You should be a part of PBS American Portrait. Because we can't paint this portrait without you. And everyone's story deserves to be heard. And I am interested in your story. I'm sure you've got something to share. Whatever's on your mind, whatever your message is, your thoughts, your family stories. We need to see each other's faces and we need to hear each other's stories. 
your hopes, your triumphs. And let us know what's going on with you in your life. Look at the prompts, and it's pretty easy. Don't be afraid. I was nervous. I was nervous, but I'm glad that I did it. It's a ripple effect, you know? Once you share your story, others are encouraged to share their story. Plus, this is something that you might be able to show your kids or your grandkids someday and say, look what I was a part of. You can be an important part of this project. To join in, go to pbs.org slash American Portrait. Go to the website. That's pbs.org slash American Portrait. Go to that, check it out, join, uh, and then, you know, we, we all can feel like we're all one. This program was made possible by by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation and by contributions to your PBS station by viewers like you. Thank you.